Jordan led us right into, into the subject matter for the night. We're going to talk about the, uh, the organization of the church, uh, the organization of the local church. Although the local church has the, it's the, it's the church, the church, uh, period. Um, you probably, I don't know, maybe you're like some of the people that, uh, you know, they don't care what the, what the church is like. They don't, organization isn't that big a deal. Maybe you're like me. I grew up in, in a very congregational-led church, Baptist, Southern Baptist Church, and we voted on everything. We had a, a, every month we had a congregational meeting uh, that sometimes got contentious, and some very stupid things were said by some very angry people at times. And, and the church has gained a reputation, not just our Southern Baptist Church. Lots of churches have gained reputation for their cantankerousness and their fighting and the divisiveness and the hurt feelings that go on, things that are said that are hurtful. Um, and, and I kind of looked at that, and I, I looked at what I could read in the Bible, and and I thought, well, you know, the, the Bible doesn't really give us a lot of information about what the church is supposed to be, how you're supposed to govern it. And, and, and I, I kind of uh, adopted an idea that, that the church, uh, that the Lord designed it that way because it was a cultural thing. That the, however it was going to fit into your culture. Uh, one of the things we studied at Prairie was the idea of indigenous churches and, and you work within their culture. Sort of like if you've read in the, in the history book, do you conquer... Uh, you know, do you kind of adapt to their culture or do you go in and just dominate and crush them and enforce your culture on them? Uh, and I thought, well, maybe that was the Lord's plan all along. We'll give you, we'll give you some leeway and give you some flex here. Um, and, and I think in one sense there is a little bit of that. Uh, but I've come to find out after years of study that there is a little more direction than what I realized was there. Uh, maybe not as, I can't, I don't think we can come to such a strong, I'm not ready to die for any of these, is what I'm saying. Uh, I don't think I need to die for church polity, or church politics, or, or the structure. But I think we can find some clear teaching in Scripture, uh, because we always have the issue, Scripture and tradition. And the famous last words of the church is, we've always done it that way. Or we've tried that and it didn't work, which means we're never doing that again. Uh, so the, the idea of bringing change into a congregation or to a church is tough. And the, the problem we have is that we, we are willing to change things we shouldn't change, like belief and doctrine, <laughs> those kind of things. And we are unwilling to change the structure and the form and the practice of some things because we've always done it that way, and that light bulb was given by my grandmother, and we don't need to change it. It was good enough for her, it was good enough for my parents, it's good enough for me. We don't need to change it, even if it is burned out, even if it's not working. Uh, we'll start with the definition. We looked at this definition earlier anyway with uh, uh, Charles Ryrie. Uh, his simple little definition of a local church is an assembly of professing believers in Christ who have been baptized and who are organized to do God's will. We had uh, spent a little bit of time looking at that when we looked at, that was our very first class, uh, the universal church or the invisible church as opposed to the local church. And uh, we didn't go into the blow-by-blow -blow details of some of those things, but uh, that's, that's a pretty good working definition of what a, a local church is supposed to be. And when we look at the, uh, the word ecclesia, ecclesia, do you remember what that word means? I didn't put it on there. Do you remember what it means? Called out ones, those who are summoned to, in, in the classical use, it was those who are summoned to a meeting. Uh, those who have been called for a purpose, uh, it was used in a political sense. Uh, you're, you're called for a purpose. You're not just, it's not just, hey, let's go hang out. It's, hey, we need to have a meeting. We need to talk about something. There's something important either that needs to be decided, you need to know about, uh, we need to get everybody on the same page. And so when the scriptures use the word ecclesia and referring to a local congregation, it's not just in that broad sense of we're called out to follow Christ, that we're called out from the world to be this unit, but we're called together with the idea there's a purpose in this and there's some structure that's inherent in this whole thing. Um, 
we looked at la was it last time. We looked about the one another's last time. Some of the purpose of the church two times ago. Uh, some of those things are listed here under the idea of the what the church gets together and does. Um, so here's the big deal: church polity, the organization. I don't know if you've ever heard the word polity. Yes. I think Debbie needs to. Sorry, I think she has a set of notes. Oh, I see what happened. That's okay. Don't don't stop for me. Uh, I'll share. I I put out eight. That's what happened. Here's mine. I can't see. Um, I've got another set of notes for you, but I. That's okay. It's probably in my briefcase. <laughs> Sorry, I I forgot we had nine people and I only put eight out there. So. Yeah. Okay. No, I can't. Oh, sure. But he can't. I can't see. He can't see. Can't he doesn't have his glasses see. on. Okay. Good. Sorry. Good. So church polity, which is just another word for structure or government. Uh, we get our word politics from it. Um, how is the church organized? Are you aware that there are a variety of ways that the church is organized? Mm -hmm. It's not the way your church is organized isn't the way every church is organized. Uh, the first one, this hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchy, I could say that, hierarchy, uh, or the idea of Episcopal, you've heard of an Episcopal church, um, there's a hierarchy, there's a, a layer and layer and layer and layer of government, there are people who are over everything, and you, you may have a, a position, but he, there's somebody over you. And so eventually there's somebody at the top. Uh, in theory, it should be the Lord, eventually, at some point. Um, here, here, it's from the Greek word, episcope. Uh, we use it in, in the King James Version of the Bible. They translated this word with uh, the word bishop. If you have a newer translation, if you have NIV, or I don't know if New King James uses bishop or not. Uh, but NIV and AS, some of the others, they don't use bishop. They'll use overseer uh, as opposed to bishop. Um, why do you think that they would use the word bishop in there when the word is episcope, means overseer? Why would they use the word bishop, do you think? Hmm? That's the way the Catholics did it. That's the way the Catholics did it? Follow the chain of, or follow the way it's always been done. Well, in, in the King James version, it was the Church of England that was that was using it there, uh, because it was a it was something they had already they had started using. They had given a title, an office, and it fit a certain form and structure of government. And so, when it came time to come back and and translate that word episcopate, which means to oversee, literally means to look at, to watch over. Uh, yeah. So was bishop, was it used as a secular word before the church adopted I don't know. It? I don't know or, what, what it was like used. A, it was, an overseer in, you know, in a, in a local government, or I wonder if it was, if they adopted it from that. Well, it, it wasn't uh, from, it wasn't Greek, yeah. and it wasn't Latin. Maybe they just wanted to sound more official. Than uh, bishop is very much a, an English word, uh, an English language word. It's um, kind of like how we translate Petros as Peter instead of rock. You know, yeah. Peter is what it refers to, and and that's you know in that time people mm -hmm. saw the word and it referred to a bishop, what they right. thought of as a bishop. Right. So. so the overseer in their in their hierarchy is a bishop, mm -hmm. and so that's why they would translate that word that way because it was a word they already used that referred to that office. And I don't know how far back they called them bishops, but they, it was kind of, we'll just use this one because it's there. And it had, it had all sorts of connotations with it is the idea. It had an office and a, and a state and a, and a level, multiple level of bishops um, that were there. Uh, government of bishops, a government by bishops. And, and I didn't put in the whole thing on the slide here, but you've got a, a whole paragraph there. Uh, it was something, the, this form of government, so that you had the local, uh, local guy, don't know that they called him bishop, uh, pastor, priest, whatever it might be, and then you had uh, somebody who was in charge of several churches, a group of churches, 
And then you had this guy over here in charge of a group of churches. So you had multiple bishops in charge of regions and areas. And then, of course, you had the archbishop. And the archbishop was in charge of a bigger region. And you even have, I think, you end up with multiple archbishops at some point because then you get the ultimate bishop uh, would be the pope, uh, the bishop of Rome, uh, would be the ultimate bishop who was supposed to be in charge of the whole shebang. So that was a form of government that uh, was kind of instituted um, second, third century, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, it's hard to find it in Scripture. You can see it because there is the idea of somebody who's overseeing things, and, and that's, it's everywhere in Scripture because we have another word that we use, that we translate it, we interchangeable with, is the word elder. And so we see it in Scripture all over the place. But it's, it, it carries, we've, we've brought in a connotation for it to fit this because that's what our structure was. And so we're going to call these people the overseers. They, that's their function. And it's a perfectly legitimate word. But it seems to me kind of backward uh, tracking it to there. Uh, it's not something we see clearly defined in Scripture to say you need to have multiple bishops in charge of multiple churches. That would be like saying, well, Paul was a bishop because he had care and responsibility for a group of churches that he helped start. And that uh, here, this other guy who had helped start these churches, he had responsibility for those. Uh, it, it doesn't always carry through clearly in Scripture that way. But you can, you know, if you, if you look hard enough and if you push it, and stretch it a little bit, you could probably try to make a case for it. I don't think it holds a lot of water. Uh, Presbyterian, federal or representative forms of, uh, of government. Uh, Presbyterian reform churches are, are part of this. And there's a, in, in, in every one of these cases, whether it's the, the Episcopal or the Presbyterian or the Congregational or whatever it is, there, there are variations on a theme. Uh, there are denominations that will have a, a certain structure like this, and then it will, and it will go this way. There will be another denomination that will have a similar structure. Maybe they will tweak it a little bit, and it won't be exactly the same, but it will be similar. And so they take the same ideas, maybe name them different things, maybe take out a level or change this over here. But it, so it's, it's a broad category is what I'm trying to say. Um, for, uh, this is... Uh, the Presbyterian form of church government where the, the local church elects certain elders who are now part of the Presbytery, uh, which is beyond just even the local, the local Presbyterian church or the local church. And then I, I skipped all that stuff in the middle and said, um, and there's a variety of other governing bodies above them that you appoint people from your congregation to this, and then from there you send people to the Presbytery, and then from there you send them to the next level, and you get a national group that makes decisions. Um, and we hear about those decisions in the Lutheran Church and the Presbyterian Church. They have their and the Southern Baptist Church. They do it in there, even though they have a congregational form of rule. They still have a denominational gathering where they vote on things and decide things, and um, somebody's going to decide somewhere. Whether, whether it's at the local level or at the upper level. And uh, sometimes those, those things don't always go the way uh, people enjoy it. Um, have you ever been involved in a, in a church that had that Episcopal form of government, Catholic, Episcopal, or Anglican, or something like that? Has that been a church you've been involved in before or know of? What about the Presbyterian form of government, where it's, it's, there, is a, there is a local eldership uh, that gets that makes decisions locally, but then it's you also are beholden to uh, multiple levels. If you've been in a denominational church, you've been beholden to another group, other churches within the, the denomination, uh, official leaders of the denomination. Um, if you've been if you've been involved in a denomination, you've had that even in the congregational form. If you've been in the Baptist church, uh, for. Uh, like uh, an illustration, uh, and that's all. All Baptists except those who say they're independent Baptists. But see, even some of the independent Baptists and some of the independent churches have formed a group 
independent fundamental churches of America. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a denomination, but there are standards. And, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with churches fellowshipping together and saying, look, w we believe these things true. Yeah, yeah, we believe those things. Uh, it's where it goes from there and, and how intrusive it gets to become. Village Missions has, has adamantly opposed and fought the idea that we are going to be a denomination. Uh, we don't see ourselves as a denomination. We see ourselves as a service, as a mission organization, uh, supplying leadership. There are, some, there are some basics that the mission insists upon, that if, if we're going to work together, if the mission is going to work with the local church, you, you, there are some things you've got to agree to, Denom doctrinally, uh, and some and just some structure for the way things are going to function as far as finances and some of that Because there's money being invested and we're going to help the church get up on its feet and moving and growing um, but they but they Back off of doing some things that uh, Personally a lot of times I wish they would do <laughs> It would make life a lot easier if they would just kind of enforce it, you know, make it happen uh, That's that function of the denomination often because there's a, there's a connection. If you're going to be a part of us, here are the rules to be a part of us. And how far do you go with those is some of the Episcopal, Presbyterian, denominational thing. Um, so th I'm not against denominations. I'm not against churches banding together and identifying themselves with one another. That's not a, a bad thing. It's, uh, it's when it gets out of whack biblically that we, we run into some problems. Um, congregational, uh, Baptist, Evangelical Free, disciples, various disciples of Christ groups are like this, independent churches, uh, almost by definition. Um, in congregational, congregational form of church government, both the autonomy of the local church and the rights of its members are stressed. Um, even though I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church and we were a part of the Southern Baptist denomination and we sent representatives to the state gathering and we sent representatives to the national gathering, uh, we were independent. We were our own boss and, and nobody told us what we were supposed to do. We did pool money for missions. We sent money to a national organization to help with missions because you can, you know, smaller churches can make a bigger impact by joining everything together. So, but that was a big deal. We decide. We decide, and if the, if the Southern Baptists try to hand down something, well, maybe we don't take that, maybe we do. We'll, we'll decide. Most of the time we did. Um, so, you know, we can, we can say as long as we've got this, we're still congregational. We don't really have that influence, but we do. Uh, it's just the way it is. Um, the rights of individual members, that idea of the priesthood of the believer is a big deal, which we mentioned, I think I mentioned it last class or so about uh, the, the cry of the Reformation was the priesthood of the believer, because we talked about the priesthood, about the picture there. Um, and it's stressed through the democratic form of government, the idea that every, ver every por person's voice counts, every person's vote counts. They may not know, have a clue about what they're voting on, but they get to vote. They may not show up for the monthly business meeting to vote. Um, the, the Southern Baptist Church I grew up in uh, well, in my high school years, um, it was a relatively small church. Um, we had an average attendance probably of 150, I'm guessing, maybe 175. We had over 300 members, and it just drove me crazy as a young buck. Wait a minute, where are all these people? We don't even know who they are. Maybe they're dead and we don't even know they're dead. That's not a good thing. Maybe they moved away. We don't even know they're gone. Why should we put up with this? We should find out who these people are. They should be involved. You know how it is with young guys. <laughs> Zeal. Zeal for thy house has consumed me. You get to vote and vote on just about anything and everything. There weren't things set up that were just automatic. You had to vote on it every time you turned around. And sometimes somebody would use that because they would be upset and then they would just cause problems. Sort of like what we see 
happening in our Congress even this night. <laughs> We're going to throw a monkey wrench into the process and shut things down and not allow things to get done because we want our way. Um, so that, that's every form of government has its problems. You know why? People. People. <laughs> because every form, there's no way for us to form an organization and structure it so that we will avoid all problems. Of course, you're referring to governments here on this earth. Governments here on this earth, correct. Because the only government that's ever going to be the right one and the correct one is the kingdom of Christ. When he is the king ruling in every way, then we got the right government. Then we've got the things working the way they're supposed to, which ultimately doesn't, in the end, I don't know, okay. We have people, so we have problems. There are, uh, the, the comment was that um, you have this form of government and it causes this set of problems. And so we resist moving to this form of government because of the problems that are with that. And sometimes we say, well, I like my problems better than I like those problems. Mm -hmm. And so we'll just keep this one. And instead of saying, well, well, let's fix these problems and let's fix these problems as much as we can, and you put the safeguards in wherever you can, you realize that you're going to have some mess regardless of how. So do you just don't do anything? There are some who would advocate no, no structure. They, they say they advocate no structure. Uh, Plymouth Brethren were some of those, and some of the Quakers would do that at times. Uh, no structure. Well, but they do. You can't have people together and not have structure, even if it's just by personality, somebody taking the lead. And, and I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I can walk into a church if I'm there for enough time. He said, I can tell you who the leaders are, even if they don't have an office, even if they aren't officially a leader. I can tell you who the leaders are after being in church for a Sunday or two because he sees who carries the influence, who is able to move things. So uh, congregational form of government, everybody votes on everything or they try to, uh, and they come to some sort of uh, agreement on that. You may not think that this is a legitimate or a real form of government. Benevolent dictator. When Rob, Pastor Rob and I were involved in uh, the Clark County prayer group, uh, pastor's prayer group, uh, there were some of, the, some of our brothers in that group who, who jokingly referred to themselves as benevolent dictators. That's how they, the church was run. They were in charge. They were the ones who handled... That, the whole, there was a whole group of churches uh, a few years back, black, black churches that were a denomination, and they were benevolent dictators, and the pastor had, was in charge of everything. Mm. He took all the money in, he dispersed the money, he did... A, no accountability, no connection, and the IRS just came down with both feet on all of them, and it was a mess. Uh, benevolent dictatorship. What the pastor says goes. And the first lady was what they would call the, the wife. Pastor's wife. That pastor's wife, they would, whatever she says. She's, you don't diss her, and she has a lot of pull because she's the pastor's wife. Um, Not necessarily a good plan. And it's not just uh, the guys that we talked with were part of a charismatic Pentecostal, a holiness group. That's, that's, that's where a lot of this was. But I've seen it in uh, independent churches that are very conservative to where the pastor becomes the dictator, either because of force of personality, and even though it may be a congregational form of government or whatever else, gains the power, gains the influence, and begins to assert authority and, and becomes very overbearing uh, and begins to tell people what they can and cannot do. You can't do this, you can't do that, and not just from a scriptural standpoint, but his own decisions. No, you are not going to uh, leave here and go to seminary because you're not planning to go into ministry. You just want to go to seminary and come back and, no, 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 you can't do that. We don't want to lose you. You have to stay here. And then when... He decides he's going anyway, won't let anybody from the church go help him move when they're moving away. I've, that, the real event. Mm -hmm. uh, or the pastor gets up and says, you as a congregation, you cannot go do this. Do not go do this. Go, go to the Billy Graham crusade. Mm -hmm. Don't even show up. Don't support it any, in any way because it's wrong and it's evil. 
Yeah. Didn't work very well for him, but uh, that's the kind of influence and the kind of dictatorship that sometimes tries to get put forward. Well, a good case in point is that we've talked about him before, the Jonesboro Baptist Church. The handful of people, and there's this, what he says goes. Uh, influences a, a handful of people, and they go from there. Uh, elder rule. I don't know if you realize conservative Baptists have, I don't know if you're familiar with conservative Baptists. Conservative Baptists have uh, recently gone to the idea that if you're going to be a conservative Baptist, be part of our denomination. Actually, they call themselves an association. I don't think they call themselves a denomination. But if you're going to be part of us, you have to have set up in your constitution, you have to transfer from congregational rule to elder rule. Uh, that took, and you, and you had to do it within a two-year period. Um, that was quite a shock for some of the, some of the people in the churches. Uh, this is the church that is led and governed by the elders who are given their authority by the congregation. Uh, congregation votes in, it's, it's that sh shortened version of the Presbyterian form of government. They generally don't have the connections outside where they have to send their elders to this other meeting to join the other elders to do some things, although some of them may do that, but it's mostly an in-house, it's mostly an independent, uh, independent group. Um, the Plymouth Brethren do this. Elders. Elders, yeah. Brethren, the Brethren movement does. I don't know about Plymouth Brethren, but the oh, Brethren, Brethren movement yes. does, yes. Yeah. yeah. The Brethren movement was uh, part, of, part of that, uh, in actually kind of bringing that to the forefront in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, Questions or comments about the, these basic forms of, of government, and, and you'll you'll see, like I said, you'll see hybrids of all of oh, these. Oh, right, you got yeah. right there. Hybrids. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very different denominations will have different levels and different names. You, you saw in the list of the Presbyterian form, there was the Reformed who had a different name mm -hmm. for the session or the. You know, I I have no idea about what level. You know, what's a cardinal. <laughs> Besides a bird or a St. Louis player, <laughs> you know, or an Arizona football player, uh, I don't know what the Cardinals do. Uh, they elect the Pope. The College of Cardinals do that. that you know, it's not in the scriptures. Uh, so you get these layers. You get these names. That's that cultural thing that gets attached to things at times. Uh, the way uh, a group of people function. I think one of the reasons congregationalism kind of caught on in the Americas so much is because, hey, we're a democracy. We want to vote. We want to have a say. Uh, and we want to have a loud say in what goes on. I got another question. Yeah. What would you think, or do you know, um, like let's say in Africa or, or the Middle East or places like that, what kind of churches are over there, do you think? All of them. All of them, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. I, I know the Catholics. Yeah. Well, see, the Episcopal form of government isn't just the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church. I, I got that. It's also Methodist Church. I, I, it was yeah. kind of like the congregational thing. I didn't know yes. if one specific kind caught on over there more than no. the no. others. You know, no. the, the, uh, fa some of the fastest growing churches in Africa are um, Episcopal form of government okay. with bishops and the whole layer of, uh, in fact, Catholic as well in some places. Uh, Okay, let's talk about the officers. These are the ones that are mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, it's, it's a fairly short list. Um, elders are mentioned. Uh, I've given you a lot more verses than what I have on the screen here. Um, central passage, you see it in 1 Timothy 3, you see it in Titus 1. Uh, I think it's significant that when, when Paul wrote to Titus, on the Isle of Crete, and he said, he said, I left you there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And what was that reason? To, to set things in order, to finish the things that I didn't get done. And what was that? That was to appoint elders in all the churches. In all the churches. And so here was, it's kind of a little insight in that who was appointing those elders? It was Titus as Paul's representative, but it was Titus who was doing it. And he gave Titus that list in chapter 1, which was, is parallel to the list in 1 Timothy 3. Not exactly the same, but basically the same idea. And I think the reason that he gave that list to Titus in that letter wasn't just 
so that Titus would remember it. I don't think Titus had a problem in knowing what it was supposed to be. I think it gave Titus ammunition to yeah. say, okay, this isn't my... This is coming from, the this is coming from Paul. Yeah. You know, Paul's the one who wrote this out. So here, see, you read it. I read it, you read it. See, it's, I'm, I'm not making this up. This is a standard that's being set in all the churches. Uh, I think I, that was my take on it whenever I was going through Titus one time. I, I bet you that's what it was because Titus had to know. He was put in charge of something. It wasn't like, well, I'll tell you, I'll teach you later after I get you out there. No, I'll teach you and then put you out there. I, I think that was probably more the, the way it worked. Um, titles. Um, overseer is the first one. We get, we, we, in culturally, we have adopted the word bishop for that. Um, describing the office, describing the duty, uh, one who oversees, one who watches out for. It's a word that is sometimes translated visitation. It's the idea of it's up close and personal. It's I'm there watching out for you. I'm keeping an eye on you, not in a in a mean-spirited sense, but in that shepherd sense. I'm actively among you. And yet, the picture we see historically of bishops, mm -hmm. bishops are how, how far removed from the common people. Mm -hmm. And so when they get out of whatever their palace or whatever, and they walk through the people, oh, isn't this wonderful? He's close to us now. And, and I understand that, oh, here's this great, powerful man who has got power, which was really ultimately mm -hmm. the issue. Uh, we'll see that more in church history. Uh, but what's it supposed to be? It's supposed to be someone who walks among, someone who's there, someone who knows what's going on firsthand, not by reports, but because there, there are those there who know firsthand. Um, Acts 20, 28. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 20. This is one of, the, one of the fundamental passages. I want to make sure we see something. And it comes up later, but I want to at least mention it now so that we I make, I make sure I get to it. Acts chapter 20. There's the farewell to the elders from Ephesus. It starts in verse 17, uh, goes to the end of that chapter. Um, he, he doesn't go back to Ephesus because he doesn't want to take the time and and the elders and their families, it seems, comes from Ephesus to meet with him. Um, and he, he goes through the, the pitch saying, you know how it was when I showed up, and you know all the things I did for you, uh, and now I'm, I'm not going to see you again. I'm, I'm going here, and I'm not going to be able to ever probably see you again. Uh, and so he gives them these final instructions for leading the church. Uh, and... It'll come up under some of our stuff on the duties of the elders, but let's look at it here. Uh, someone wants to read it for us, uh, verse 28, 29, 30, and 31. Therefore, Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Start at 28. 28 to 28. 31. Therefore take heed to yourselves and all... Where's my place? Sorry. Okay. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock among your, among which the Holy Spirit has has made you, overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he he purchased with his own blood. Twenty nine. Mm -hmm. For I know this is this. Excuse me. For I know this that after my departure, savage wolves will come, come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember, remember, sorry, remember that. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not, did not cease to warn everyone, everyone night and day with tears. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. There's, there's a lot in there. Uh, these guys are called that the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. If you go back to verse 17, what does it call them in verse 17? These men who came to meet with Paul, they're called elders. elders. 
in verse 28, they're called overseers. Or if we were consistent in our translation with the King James, it'd say bishops. Made you bishops of them. Overseers. Same, it's, it's interchangeable in its use. The title uh, has to do with the function or the, the work. Uh, the word elder has to do with the idea of the office, the position has a certain air of dignity, is the respect that is due to them. Um, presbyteros is the word. We get the word Presbyterian from the idea of this word. Uh, we get the word Episcopalian from the other word. Uh, Acts 20.17, we looked at that already in Titus 1.5. Yeah? So do the elders just basically enforce what the pastor says? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. And if I don't answer it, we'll come back to it. Okay? Uh, it depends on if he's a benevolent dictator or not. <laughs> Qualifications. No, uh, shepherd. Oh, there's one more. One more. The title of shepherd. Pastor, teacher. We, first Timothy, I mean, uh, first Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Uh, shep, pastor, teacher. Uh, concerns the duty, the concern, uh, and concern, and the concern that he's to have. Uh, if you are shepherding, You have to have some concern for this, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have some sort of sense of responsibility. Uh, it, it's, it, when, when Paul talks about having the burden of all the churches, there's a, there's a care. I care about them. Uh, I would probably not make a good physical shepherd of physical sheep. Mm -hmm. Not a big fan. <laughs> not a big fan. I love the church. I love God's people. I love to do that. that. That is a burden, a concern in my life. Not too big a fan of the sheep, of those sheep. Um, somehow that gets messed up in the, in the translation. Qualifications. This is something that uh, every time that I have ever brought this up in, in church, any of the churches that I was ever in, I'll tell you what happens. You bring it up, you say, okay, uh, and, and most church constitutions will try to follow this to some degree. They'll have it somewhere in their constitution that whether it's the board members or the elders or the deacons or whatever they want to call them, they'll usually have some sort of qualifications that are listed there. Uh, but then it's kind of like the vote for the, for the budget. Let's not get into too much detail. Just give me what I want to know and we'll just, we'll just say, okay, we're going to give everybody a break. We'll wink and nod and, and not make a, a tough call. Um, Every time I would bring this up, the idea of here's what God wants us to be, and here's what those who are going to lead in the church should be, then everybody starts backing away. <laughs> All the men start backing away. No, I, I can't measure up to that. I don't measure up to that. I never will measure up to that. And, and so then it gets pushed where they're pushing. Well, you're the elder. You're the guy who's supposed to lead. That's how those benevolent dictators get in charge. Because everybody just abdicates because they aren't what, they don't meet the qualifications, at least in, in their thinking, in their mind. Um, these are four general areas. The, the overarching thing is, the, the, the one thing that kind of controls it all is the idea of being above reproach, blameless. And then everything that comes after that relates back to the idea of blameless. Nowhere does it say that you have to be perfect. We can't. Can't be. No, nowhere does it say you can't have ever failed. Paul failed big time, didn't he, against the church. And yet he gets restored to this, and it always was a, 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 an amazement to him that he got to be in part of this. The biggest key to understanding... You know, you, we, can, we can talk about the, the husband of one wife, and we can talk about, you know, not being addicted to wine, and we can talk about not being a pugilist. Don't be a fighter. You're just going to punch people out. You know, don't be, don't be this and don't be that. And we say, well, that's for the elders. That's for the leaders. And I can't be that, so I, that means I can be addicted to much wine. That means I can be a pugilist. That means I can not be a one-woman man. No, no, no. 
a pugilist is a is a fighter, a brawler, somebody who's going to fight you as opposed to be yielding and humble. Okay. Yeah, it's it's the the Greek word for one of the one of the qualities that's there. Um, here's here's the key to under I think one of the keys to understanding this is that this is talking about the direction that you're going. It's not that you've attained. None of us have attained to these levels. Which direction are you going? If you're going the right direction, because what are these guys supposed to be doing? And they're guys, by the way. What are Because it's the husband of one wife. They're supposed to be leading. They're supposed to be leading. Showing examples of Christ. Be examples. So w w show us the way to go. And if you're going the right direction, now you, you may not be ready to be an elder yet, but are you going the right direction? And the reality is at some point you're going, to, you're going to find yourself, if you're going the right direction, you're going to be leading, whether you have the office or not. <laughs> and the sad thing is, is that right now you are leading, whether you realize it or not, whether you have the office, because people are looking at you, people know you, and they say, okay, well, that's what a Christian's supposed to be. And maybe they're following you, maybe they're not following you, because they don't like what they see. There's personal things, there's family things, there's things about your marriage, there's things about your kids, if you have kids. Uh, my, my grandmother said, well, then it must mean that you have to be married and you have to have children. And there, there are some who would say that if you were married and your wife died, you could never remarry <laughs> because you were to be the husband of just one wife. Or if you're divorced and... Or if you're divorced. Or if you're never married. Or if your spouse is divorced and you're... Your spouse is divorced, yeah. 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 All those things get thrown in there. A lot of that is cultural. Um, if, if, if this person's not an elder because back at some point in their pre-Christ days, they made a bad decision, married the wrong That's person, then do we hold that to here? I, I, there is, there's nothing else in there that says when you make the bad decision on any of those other things that it carries over. Uh, there are those who will fight me to the death on that. Um, and I used to be in that camp even, even that strong at times. Uh, but I'm, I'm beginning to see, or I think that I see it this way, and maybe that's because I'm getting old and liberal. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, <laughs> that it's more about the direction you're going. If you're going the right direction, that's the, that's the thing that matters. And we can't buy off and say, well, because I was divorced, then I can't be an elder, so never mind, I don't have to do any of these things. No, the only reason we have these qualities there is because that's the way all of us are supposed to be going. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every Christian is supposed to be this way. Whether it's husband of one wife or the husband of one wife or one husband. <laughs> one woman, man, one man, woman. That's really the heart of it that we're looking for. We're looking for the person who's going to be reflecting the character of Christ because we're all supposed to be disciples, becoming more and more like Christ. So to me, and this is where the church has punted over and over again because either we just pass on the idea of qualities and qualifications, never mind. You're living, you're breathing, you're willing. Mm -hmm. You have money. You have business experience. Okay, yeah, come on. We need somebody like that. And we, and we begin to let people into leadership that shouldn't be in leadership because we just need some bodies out there. And uh, some, of the, some, of these, some of these structures don't work very well because there's not, they're not people that are qualified to be in leadership. And there's no mechanism to get them there. That's the big deal, trying to get them into that place. Um, how many elders are supposed to be in a church? Some will say there's only one elder in each church, and that would be the pastor. No. Wow. And there are others who say, no, there's multiple elders in a church. Um, in its usage, when we see it in Scripture, it's not always clear. Because, you know how language is. 
you're using it and you have a plural, but then you have a singular and you, well, is that multiple elders in each church or elders for e elders in the churches? Uh, we, ha we have a couple of examples there. First Timothy 3, Ryrie brings this up as a, as a big point to him. Not that it's the final answer, but the word, the description for the qualifications, the qualification for an elder, it's used in a singular word. When we come to the deacons, we're going to see that it's used in a plural. It's multiple deacons. And uh, if you read a variety of things, you'll see, well, yeah, this, these are, they, everybody tries to relate it to whatever their current structure of church government is. And so this would correspond to board members, and this would correspond to this, and these would be the deacons and the pastor. The, in the Southern Baptist Church, uh, the pastor was the elder. I always wondered, well, who's the elder? And I was told the pastor's the elder. And then you got the deacons who are there, who are the board members, and then they do whatever the deacons did besides... Oh, never mind. Besides the things I didn't think they should do. Um, Acts 20, verse 17 implies that, that there were multiple elders in, in churches, more than one. James talks about, if you're sick, call for the elders, elders of the church to come and to pray for you. Um, I, I think from a practical standpoint, doesn't it make more sense, just from a... a the logistics of things, that you need more than one person. Um, we, we talked about the benevolent dictator. We talked about the, the one person who, you know, you don't want to put the big decisions into one person's hand. You, you have a few involved in that, but there are some things that, hey, you're in charge of the projector. Just take care of it. You know, there are things like that that need to be taken care of, but uh, Proverbs counsels us over and over again that there's wisdom in council and getting other people involved. It's just, who are you going to get involved? Let's have everybody who's a member of the church in, in whatever form and whatever stage they are spiritually, we'll have them make the decision or we'll go through and pick out who this, the most spiritual leaders are among us who have a heart for seeking after God and want to do what, have a concern for the church and we'll let them be the ones who give us direction and, and show us leadership. Um, I think we can make a case that it's probably multiple. Uh, here are some of those duties. Uh, the shepherd, the preach and teach, obviously one of the main things a, an elder is supposed to do. Uh, preside or guide or rule. Can't, we can't escape that, that idea that's there in Scripture that there's an authority structure and elders are to be those in authority at uh, some level there. Uh, they're responsible to protect the flock, the body of Christ from false teachers, mm -hmm. from teachers from outside, teachers, false teachers from within, uh, to be examples of true believers. They're to, be, they're to be those who pray for the sick, as we mentioned already. Acts 11.30. Look at that. Someone read that for us. Acts 11.30. Because they're supposed to be in charge of finances. Does that mean the elders has to do the books and write the checks? Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily, but there needs to be somebody who oversees it. Ah, there you go. There's that word. Elder, oversee. Episcopal. Acts 11.30 says what? Who's got it? Amanda? And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So the Barnabas and Saul were gathering offerings for the church in Jerusalem. And when they delivered it, who did they deliver it to? The elders, the elders not the apostles. I don't think there were hardly any apostles left in, in Jerusalem. Well, no, they were. There were some apostles there. They didn't give it to the apostles. And they didn't give it to the seven who were in charge of the widows. They gave it to the elders. Now... Who was in charge of the money early on in the process? When, when they sold their stuff and they brought it to the apostles. apostles. So somewhere between early chapters, what, 4, 5, 6, 7, and chapter 11, something has changed. Because then in chapter 15, we have the apostles and elders in this council. And they're established there. So 
there was some development that had taken place over the course of those few chapters in the book of Acts. So those are some of the duties of what elders were supposed to do. Uh, let's talk about deacons. Um, 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13 is the primary passage of, uh, almost exclusively, of, uh, because deacons aren't referred to in Acts chapter uh, 6. They aren't called deacons. They just said, pick out some guys that we can give this responsibility to. And notice in chapter 6, if we do relate it to deacons, which I'm not opposed to, they had qualifications. Pick out men like this and like this and like this. And we saw some of those men, Philip and Stephen in particular, who went out and began to preach as well. Wasn't part of their job description as deacons, but it was part of their job description as disciples. disciples. Let's make sure we understand that. Even if the deacons, as we'll make a point, deacons don't have the responsibility to rule. They don't have the responsibility to teach as deacons, but as disciples... They have the responsibility to teach and to preach and to witness and to do all those things. Uh, this is just for the structure of things. It's the word for, for service. You'll see the word servant, servant's Bible school, deacon's Bible school, we could say. The idea was someone who waited tables, someone who served others. It's, it's not a glamorous high... but. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, those who serve as deacons, who serve well and honorably and do the work hard, what have they gained? They've, they've deserved, they've gained high standing. They've gained a high standing. And, and, and they please the Father in the midst of that. Um, the qualifications for them are similar to those of the elders, except there's an addition of don't be a gossip. Why would they have that special qualification in there? If they're out serving, who, who knows more about what's going on than the person who's out doing the serving and helping people in the midst of it? It's the, it's the deacon. It's the person who's serving, who's on the front line, doing something on the ground, as it were, that would have the information that could get corrupted and twisted around rather than be something that was... Good. Duties. What are the duties of the deacon? Um, well, if you look at Acts, then they're supposed to take money and take care of the poor. But, but what else does it tell us in the scriptures about their duties? <laughs> help the elders. They're, they're to serve, they're to help the elders. That's really the heart of whatever, the duty of the deacon is whatever the elders ask them to do. It's kind of like what we saw in Acts 6 where the Apostles said, look, this is an important thing that needs to be done, taking care of these widows. We can't do it. We need to put our time and energy into prayer and the ministry of the Word and God's Word. We need to put our time into this, and if we take time from that, then we can't get that job done. So we'll do this job. You guys take this job. And so that's why we look at Acts chapter 6 and say, well, that looks like a deacon to me. They're serving the people who are leading and teaching. And so, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm not sure at the time of Acts 6 that they even really necessarily thought of these positions right. as being as such. I just thought they, they probably looked around and said, hey, oh, we can use these guys, you know, yeah. instead of, like, trying to call them a deacon. Or right, a, I, there or was no mention of deacon there, so there was no... Yeah, yeah. it was just, I, I mean, this is it my... It was a responsibility, on. not yeah. a position. Yeah. Right, it was a responsibility, not a position. Good point. Yeah, yeah. that is a good point. Yeah. And, and whose responsibility is it to help somebody in need? The person who sees it's, it's, it's everyone's responsibility. Yeah. Uh, and this is just a way to organize it in order to get it done better. Because this was, a, this was an identifiable group. This was an organized church. And there were people who had great needs. Okay, we need to get, we need to get a better handle on this. That's what the leaders are supposed to do. Make sure that needs are being taken care of. That's, that's really the heart of that. And so the deacon, the office of deacon, if you will, and, and they were there. Philippians 1.1 1, 1 talks about the elders and the deacons at Philippi. So they were obviously there in that time when Paul wrote to them. They were already established. They probably weren't clearly established in the early days. It was part of that process of, 
of getting there, but the elders came in somewhere without a big fanfare. The deacons came in somewhere without a big fanfare. It was just the way it developed, the way it grew. It was a matter of logistics. As a matter of logistics. I mean, it, as the church grew, it had to have some structure that Form grew with it. followed the function. Yeah. We have this function that we need to do, then let's build the form so that we can get it done and, and do it effectively and do it to bring glory to God. Um, no reference to teaching as a duty and no reference to uh, ruling in the church. So the deacons weren't part of the ruling group. Uh, deaconesses. 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 Women? Is there such women who are deacons? Is there such a such an animal? <laughs> Is there such a thing? Uh, two, two verses that uh, give us consideration here is uh, Romans chapter 16, uh, verse 2. talks about Phoebe. Uh, she's called in 16.2. Paul writes and says, uh, pay attention, note, note her. She's a uh, take care of her, help her in her in her work and what she's doing, because she's a servant of the church, a good one. Uh, it's possible that it could mean a servant of the church, a deacon of the church in a because deacon was just the word for servant, and so all of us are to be deacons in that regard. Uh, apart from a, an official, it's the function as opposed to the title, the office. So maybe it was just referring to her as she does this function, she serves the church. Or it could be that she was actually a deaconess. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Right in the middle of talking about deacons and their qualifications and all this stuff about them, right in the middle it, it, it stops and it starts talking about women. Uh, some translations might put wives. It's possible that it could be referring to wives of deacons, which would kind of make sense in the idea that if you've got this guy that's going to have this responsibility, it would be good for him to have his wife with him and they can do things together. You know, it could be a practical issue. And then after a couple of verses about that, the qualifications there, it goes back to deacons again. And so some think that it really wasn't about the office of deacon as much as it was about the deacon and his wife who are going to do this. Um, one, one guy thought that maybe the, uh, the passage in 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10 about putting the widows on the list, who are widows indeed, that the church is going to support and take care of, that that would maybe they had to be over 60 years old. Maybe that's what they were talking about there. I don't know. Some people say there was no office of deaconess. It didn't happen. I don't know. So that means no women should serve. <laughs> Every person should be a deacon in that regard. But if there is the office of deacon, it seems to me like there, there are responsibilities that, there are, that women should take care of especially in relation to women, that men and maybe the deacons and deaconesses, I don't know how that works. See, it doesn't, it doesn't quite give us all that we want, does it? It doesn't give us the blow by blow. It doesn't lay it out the way we, we want it. Um, there's that. Here, here's what I wanted to get to. Though there are qualifications for something there in, in Timothy, uh, some think it's doubtful that, th that they even existed. But why would he have qualifications mm -hmm. if there wasn't something you were qualified for? Because every Christian, every disciple of Christ, you're, whether you're qualified or not, you are called to be a servant. Mm -hmm. So if it's more than just your regular duty as a follower of Christ, and there's qualifications, which there should be, if you're going to have a, an office or a position, I, I tend to lean towards the idea that there probably was, probably should be, um, and there's that widow's thing here. Uh, the New Testament seems to support the, the idea of plurality of elders. You take all of it put together, it looks like that's probably the, the strongest indication. Um, if you want to fight over it, you can fight over it. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to die on that sword. Um, 
certainly the idea of the hierarchical form had not, there's no way that it was ever in the New Testament. There was never layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, they'll try to read into it at times and say, well, Paul was the bishop over these churches and John was the bishop over these churches because John had a connection. And Peter had his connection with certain churches. And it very well may be that there was something, some responsibility there, but it certainly wasn't the level of stuff that got developed in the next couple of centuries. Um, Episcopos, Presbyteros, same group. Not two different groups. Um, the idea of leaders from various churches gathering in council to work out issues. Acts 15. Uh, I think there's some legitimacy to that. In church history, we saw where they had church councils, where the leaders of various churches got together. It was really one church, but it was multiple places. Got together the people with the, what they thought were the best minds and the, and the best intentions. And, and many times they did some really, really, really good work. The canonization, what, what's the scripture? Uh, coming up with the creeds, the things we believe. Dealing with the deity of Christ and those doctrines, those things. They battled and they worked hard and they came up with some very good things. Uh, but then they also came up with a lot of other things eventually. Because then they became a standing committee that met all the time. Mm -hmm and had to come up with something to justify their existence, so they came up with all kinds of other things. Is Acts 15 a model? Is it something that needed to be perpetuated? Is it, it, it certainly is not a prohibition against churches getting together or an association of Christians meeting together to try to deal with things, whether a discipline issue or on, on a bigger level or teaching and doctrine, heresy and things like that. Um, I, I don't know how far we need to take it, but I don't think we need to dismiss it either and say all the ideas of churches coming to some agreement is a, is a wrong idea. Um, this paragraph here, uh, the very lack of... I have, did I put that on there? Yeah, I did. The very lack of any clear, rigid, complete outline of government is an indication that the church was not to be a stereotyped legalistic body, but rather a spiritual body ruled as the head sees fit. Most of the doctrine we can build of church government in the New Testament must be illustrative rather than legislative. We're inferring. We, we see this picture, and we see this picture and say, okay, therefore, this is how it, it looked. There are, were there elders? Yeah, there were elders. Were there overseers? Yeah, there were overseers. Were they the same? Yeah, they were the same. There were deacons. We, we see those things, but how come we don't see a much clearer why don't we have a constitution? Why don't we have something that spells it out in, in blow by blow detail? It's, it's here, it's hidden here and a little bit there and we see it as we look at the book of Acts, you see, wait a minute, there are elders there with the apostles. Where did they come from? We didn't have elders until that moment. Now we see elders. So it, we're, illust we're intuitively picking up on this, which brings us to this. Um, we may deduce how they organize, but can also have room for much charity towards those who differ. No reason to fight over this. No reason to die over this. No reason to cast somebody out and say, you are anathema and you are a heretic, so get away from me. Are, there are inherent problems at every level. You can pick the wrong people to be elders in good faith. After much prayer and fasting, you pick the elders and you get the wrong guy in there. Because in Acts 20, he says, not only will they come from the outside, they're going to come up from within your own group. So you've got to be on guard all the time. Because we're dealing with people, we're dealing with humanity. So regardless of that government. Um, Ephesians 4, 11 and, 11 and 12. Uh, three general offices for the church and then one particularly for... Uh, each church individually. I uh, Just real brief look, apostles, that's the stuff you're memorizing the Ephesians for. He gave some. He gave gifts to men. He gave some as apostles. Um, and you have uh, quite a bit of information there about the apostles themselves and, and the idea that they're capital A apostles and they're small A apostles 
uh, is something we need to make sure we clarify. The, the office of apostle did not carry over. Because apostle just means messenger. sent one, messenger, somebody who is sent with a message. And so you had the big A apostles that Jesus Christ sent, then you had the small A apostles that went around and delivered messages as well. And, and you have a list. I gave you some others who were called apostles. Um, and, along, and along with the prophets, they were the foundation for the church and putting together God's word. Uh, oops, we'll go back to prophets. Uh, you see them there in Acts. That's, they're there. And sometimes it's predictive of a famine that's coming. Or this is what the Holy Spirit is saying about the person who owns this belt. This is what's going to happen. Uh, it wasn't meaning that Paul wasn't supposed to go. It was just making sure everybody knew what he was going to. That he was going to bondage and jail and, and not going to be around. Uh, Proverbs, I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us what about prophecy? That it will be done away with. There will be a time when it's done away with. Uh, you can say, well, why don't we see apostles anymore? They're dead. We have a kind of a form of apostles when we have anybody that we send out with a message, whether it's missionaries or whoever it might be. Why don't we have prophets? Well, some people say they are prophets. Well, it seems like they didn't have their all the New Testament written. They didn't have the New like, Testament. They probably needed prophets. Yeah. And I don't know that we've got, pro certainly not in this sense, not in this foundational sense that was talked about there. Evangelists. We have evangelists? Oh, yeah, we've got evangelists. Are the evangelists that we talk about the same as the evangelists in the Scripture? I don't know. Philip was an evangelist. Uh, who was the other one? I had Stephen was an evangelist. Um, Philip and Timothy. Timothy was told to do the work of an evangelist, even though he was doing some other things. And then pastor, teacher, the Ephesians 4 passage. where This is where we would probably say, where do you get the pastor, teacher? I think there's a sense of calling for sure. that it's, He's listed as, as a gift from the Lord to his church. And so I think there is that sense of having a sense of calling, that encounter where you have that sense God wants you to do this, as in the other cases. But I think there's also um, the idea that it comes from the elders. That among those who are elding, those elders, what are those elders? One of their jobs is to teach and preach God's word. And so you have that inherent in there as well. This is from John MacArthur. Uh, it's not unique to him. I, I gave you a quote there that he had in relation to this. Uh, this is how Paul writes to Timothy about his responsibility as a, as a servant of God, as a minister, which is a servant, as one who was uh, an elder, if you will, or a, a, his apostle, one that he sent out to work. He calls him a teacher, a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, a workman, a vessel, and a slave. Uh, and, and MacArthur makes this comment. He says, each of these images evokes the ideas of sacrifice, labor, service, and hardship. They speak eloquently of the complex and varied responsibilities of spiritual leadership. Not one of them makes out leadership to be glamorous. If you're, if you're thinking about wanting to be an elder or being a leader in the church... Boy, is there honor to that? Sure, there should be honor. We're told to honor those in authority over us. But look at what it is. It's, it's being, being a teacher. Oh, yeah, I'd like to be a teacher. And some of those who want to be teachers don't even know what they're talking about, <laughs> Paul says. Being a soldier. Oh, I like to be a soldier. I like to wear a uniform and carry a gun. Oh, well, you've got to realize, wait a minute, a soldier has to do battle. Has to get in there. Athletes. Oh, yeah, I want to win the gold medal. You've got to do all the training. You've got to do all the hard work. The farmer. Oh, what a glamorous life. Right, huh, Mark? <laughs> the workman who's not ashamed because he, he works hard at it. And, and the vessel that's just there to receive. What's the, some are to honor, some are to dishonor. It's whatever the Lord decides. And if the Lord wants to take this vessel and put it over here and use it for this purpose, okay. That's what I'm here for, and ultimately a slave. Uh, 
I gave you a quote, this quote here from um, Alexander Strzok, who has written extensively on the idea of biblical eldership. Um, I'll let you read that. It's powerful. It's a powerful statement. Um, and how the church bails on, because we, we, we buy into the tradition as opposed to buying into what we see in the scriptures, and we abandon what God has offered to us. And, and there, I think there is a correlation between what we talked about last time, about the church losing its focus on the purpose, the, the task before us of making disciples. And when we lost, we lost that focus, and hand in hand with that, we lost that structure that promotes that focus. And that was the, the form that would help promote that. And we, we get the levels of, of bureaucracy, hierarchy, that, that makes it impossible to get things done. And it doesn't, you don't have to have a hierarchy to do that. You can have a congregational form of government that doesn't get anything done. You can have elders or a board that makes all the decisions and you don't get anything done. Mm -hmm. I've lived it. <laughs> I know that's so how it works. Uh, so it, it's not a magic pill to say, well, if we just get some elders, then we'll be, the, we'll be a New Testament church. Well, we're already a New Testament church. We've got just as much problems as they did. <laughs> and that's not going to make it better by just adopting a form of government. Uh, so let's make sure we understand that. What's, what's going to make a difference is when we begin to raise up men who will be elders whether they have the office or not. Where we raise up women who will be examples and in that sense elders, those who are leading the way, whether they are, have an office or not. They're going to be the examples for others to follow. When we raise up men and women who will be deacons, who will serve others sacrificially and, and make themselves available to those in authority to say, I'm ready to help. I don't have the office of this, but I'll do whatever it needs to, needs to happen to help you with your job, and, I, and I'll help others. It's what we're supposed to do, period. Um, Mark chapter 10. I, I highlighted this, bolded it for you, underlined it. Uh, Jesus, and it's, it's Matthew, it's Mark, and it's Luke. And it's almost not exactly word for word in each of those, but it's, it's awfully close. Uh, James and John wanted to have the seats right and left hand. The other disciples got angry at them because they wanted those spots. So Jesus calls them all together. And he says to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Something that Peter mentions. And I don't know if you've ever said it. I've had people, well, you're just lording it over me. If you try to exercise authority, if you try to offer leadership, well, you're just lording it over me. You're being... That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the proper use of authority. It's talking about the abusive use of authority. Uh, they, they lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority, and that's in a negative way, over them. But it is not this way among you. You wish to be great? You wish to be the leader? Be the servant. Because, the last part there, because... The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom. When I was reading through the church history book, this phrase kept coming back again and again. But it is not to be this way among you. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And the church adopted these styles and these, these methods and these ways of trying to govern things and to force the issue and rule with an iron fist and point of the sword and will convert everybody that way. Not this way among you. And I thought, if you just remembered that phrase, we could have saved ourselves a lot of heartache and we could have done a much better job. And we can look back in history and see that, but we need to look right here in our hearts. Not that way among us. The danger at every form of government is people trying to grab power. Is there a place for authority? Yes, there is a place for authority. But when you grab that authority and you protect it and you guard it and you abuse that authority, it's not supposed to be that way. We've got the wrong people in the wrong positions at that point. Uh, quick question or comment. Did I answer your question about the elders and the pastor? Pastor is basically one of the elders. So um, the pastor's 
Elders, right? Because elders help the pastors, so... No, the deacons, the elders, deacons. the elders, the elders include the pastor. Pastor is just another name for maybe a particular elder, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure where that would, how that would fit in the New Testament. Uh, but these elders were in charge of shepherding the flock. And then the deacons were there to help the elders do their job. Okay. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the glimpse of what we've seen some of. And Lord, we, we want to be those who are balanced and walking according to your word. And, and yet, Lord, we realize that the structure isn't the thing. The structure has a place and, and, and it's necessary. But Lord, more importantly, is the quality and character of our lives as your disciples. And so, Lord, help us to see. Help us to aspire, if not to the office, but to the lifestyle and to the commitment and to the spirituality of those who are elders. Continue, Lord, to strengthen us for the task ahead, that we would bring glory and honor to you, that we would be those who serve well and serve faithfully and serve in love. In Jesus' name, amen.